And a pleasant good morning to you here, Russ Barkley, coming to you from lovely Richmond, Virginia, where it's getting a little late in August and I'm getting a little long in the tooth as well. So let's get started. As always, a couple of dad jokes for you. This comes from the website of menshealth.com. So here we go. If a pig loses its voice, does it become disgruntled? Uh, you tell me. Not sure about that one. Here's another one. Want to hear a joke about paper? Oh, never mind. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah, that one's pretty bad, I think. All right, last one up is a panic-stricken man explained to his doctor, you have to help me. I think I'm shrinking. Now settle down, his doctor said calmly. You'll just have to learn to be a little patient. Oh, clinical joke there. Okay, let's get on with our research. We've got five articles to discuss this morning, albeit briefly. And the first article up comes to us from the journal BMC Psychiatry. And it's an article out of Norway, as I recall. And this is a study of adolescents using a general population sample. They're going to simply assess level of ADHD symptoms. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in doing so, they're also looking at self-reports of self-harm of various types. So that usually means attempts to injure yourself, of course. And so they're using a very large population. Over 9,600 adolescents participated in this study. And they then separated them into those who screened positive for high symptoms of ADHD and those who did not. And what did they find? they found that about 15% of the teens with high levels of ADHD symptom, symptoms excuse me, had engaged to some extent in self-harm. That was versus only about 5% of the typical population. So we're looking here at a nearly three times greater risk for self-harm in teens with ADHD. Now they, they look closer to see what might be contributing to this increased risk of self-harm beyond just high levels of ADHD symptoms. And of course, they found what earlier research has also found, and that is that symptoms of conduct disorder, the more conduct disorder, the greater the likelihood of self-harm. Uh, family history, other family members engaging in self-harm, and family members who had attempted suicide were also predictors of whether this individual with high ADHD symptoms, would also engage in self-harm. So uh, an important study out of Norway that continues the already existing lines of evidence pointing to a greater risk of self-harm, suicide ideation, that is thinking of suicide, and suicide attempts, as well as suicide completion in people with ADHD, particularly if they have comorbid depression, conduct problems, and a history of self-harm within the family as well. So very important study there. Next up is a study that comes to us. This one uh, is over in the journal Archives of Sexual Behavior, and it's out of Canada, and it's a study of sexual dysfunction, that is functioning problems, in people with high levels of ADHD symptoms. Uh, this study suggests that People with ADHD self-reported their degree of sexual functioning, satisfaction, and dysfunctioning. And they found that those with ADHD were more than twice as likely to report difficulties with sexual functioning, particularly difficulties with arousal, uh, with orgasm, uh, and overall sexual satisfaction. And this was after even controlling for other variables such as biological sex, age, and even sexual orientation. They still found this link to problems with sexual functioning. Again, not a new finding, but one that's been replicated outside the U.S. We've seen these findings in U.S. studies, particularly longitudinal studies like my own. So just more evidence accumulating now on difficulties with sexual functioning and those with ADHD. It does tend to make sense when you think about the attention problems, especially the emotion regulation problems, uh, along with overall executive functioning, might interfere with sexual activity 
and functioning. Our third paper is a study out of Italy, and this is a review. It's a meta-analysis, a systematic review of all of the studies that looked at whether or not people prescribed stimulant medication for ADHD were also misusing the drug by other means, perhaps taking it excessively, uh, perhaps crushing and injecting it or uh, uh, sniffing it, uh, taking it nasally, that is, and so on. So they're looking at rates of misuse among those who are given a prescription for stimulants for their ADHD. And what they found is that in more than half of the studies, there was no evidence of misuse at all. But in the other half of the studies, the range of misuse was as low as 2% to as high as 29%, suggesting that in some samples and some studies, there was a small degree of misuse of the stimulant prescription. But overall, we can say that there's a pretty low rate of misuse of prescriptions by those receiving stimulants for treatment of their ADHD. And I think that's pretty good news. Uh, the review did find that uh, things that predicted misuse were, for instance, uh, a history of alcohol uh, or other substance misuse. That's also been found in college students who are misusing stimulants. And that is that those who do tend to have not only elevated symptoms of ADHD, but a history of drug use, uh, excessive drug use or substance abuse as well. So uh, just a nice review there showing us that the prescribing of stimulants isn't really contributing a great deal to stimulant misuse in the population, particularly by those with ADHD who get those prescriptions. Our fourth paper this morning is going to be from the Journal of Clinical Anesthesia. It's also a meta-analysis, and it's a review of the research that has found some link between early childhood exposure to general anesthesia and risk for developing ADHD. This study found that in looking across all of the papers, there was a trend for those who had been exposed to anesthesia and to the length of anesthesia and risk for having ADHD in that child. Uh, so suggesting that maybe exposure to anesthesia in childhood might increase the risk for ADHD. That's at least how the authors interpret it. But hold on a second. We all know that ADHD in children markedly increases the risk for accidental injury, for visits to the emergency room, for injuries of all kinds, including lacerations, trauma, burns, and so on, and for the severity of injuries. These are children who are also likely to be admitted out of the emergency room into the hospital and subjected to surgery. So it's very possible that it's not the anesthesia, that the anesthesia is simply a marker for the fact that these children have higher rates of ADHD. And that high rate of ADHD leads to greater injury. Greater injury leads to hospital admission, may lead to greater exposure to surgery requiring anesthesia. And that explains the link between ADHD and anesthesia. And the authors don't really entertain that explanation very well, but it's just as reasonable as the one they wish to entertain from this correlational study that it's the anesthesia that's creating the risk. I'm not sure. I think we need better controlled and longitudinal studies here to disentangle these risks. They certainly should have assessed for ADHD in the child and in the family upon admission before the children were exposed to anesthesia as one means of possibly ruling out pre-existing ADHD as an explanation for this finding. Okay, our last study comes to us uh, dealing with the neuroscience of ADHD. This is in the journal CNS Neuroscience and Therapeutics, and it's about the activation of the default mode network in adults with ADHD. So this is a study that's doing functional MRI assessment of brain activity in individuals. This is just during their resting state now, not while they're doing any tasks. And they're going to compare 84 adults with ADHD to 89 healthy 
typical controls, and they're looking at the extent to which the activation in the default mode network, its functional connectivity, is in any way impaired in these adults. Uh, and what they find is that in these adults, there's over connectivity between the mind wandering default mode network and connections to the several attention systems in the brain, suggesting that the default mode network is somehow interfering with attention uh, and that there's too much connectivity here, perhaps. But in any case, overall, there was a reduction in connectivity between the default mode network and other parts of the brain and an increase in connectivity with some of the attention circuits. Perhaps this helps to explain how mind wandering and ADHD can disrupt attending to the external environment. I wonder if this also might have more to do with cognitive disengagement syndrome, that other attention disorder that I've talked about on this channel on other videos. Go have a look at those if you're not familiar with that attention disorder, which we believe is a disorder of mind wandering, daydreaming, and possibly mind blanking, and in which we would expect a higher degree of involvement of the default mode network. Okay, so lots of interesting research this week. I hope you enjoyed this review of findings from the journals, and I hope you'll join me next week for uh, some bad dad jokes and more reviews of new research. In the meantime, if you're not a subscriber, as always, I suggest that you subscribe and recommend the channel to others that you might think would have an interest in this information. Okay, everybody, thanks a lot for tuning in. As always, take care, live well, and be well. Bye now.